Hello, I'm David Brown. I'm chair of the INNS uh, College of Fellows. And today I'm inter interviewing Professor Stephen Grossberg. Stephen Grossberg is one of the principal founders of our field. For the past 50 years, he has been the world's leading researcher modeling how biological intelligence in all its variety is realized by our brains. <laughs> Along the way, he has collaborated with over 100 PhD students and postdocs and multiple faculty. His work has energized an intellectual revolution aimed at understanding autonomous adaptive intelligence, both of biological brains and of large scale algorithms and robots for engineering and technology. When Steve started, there was no field of neural networks. He began to fill this gap by founding key institutional infrastructure for the field, including the INNS and the journal Neural Networks. His leadership as general chairman of the first 1987 IEEE International Conference on Neural Networks, and as a principal organizer of the 1988 first INNS annual meeting, led to the fusion of these conferences as the International Joint Conference on Neural Networks, IGACNN, which of course continues to this day. He is a fellow of multiple society and has published 17 books on or journal special issues, over 500 research articles and has seven patents. He has received multiple awards to acknowledge these contributions. The most recent of these awards are the 2015 Norman Anderson Lifetime Achievement Award of the Society of Experimental Psychologists, the 2017 Frank Rosenblatt Award of the IEEE, and the 2019 Donald O. Hebb Award of the INNS. You can find lectures and articles about this work on his webpage, sites, S-I-T-E-S dot B-U dot E-D-U slash Steve G, S-T-E-V-E-G. Well, Professor Grossberg. You're just Steve David. <laughs> How did you start your this illustrious career? Well, I started actually when I was a freshman at Dartmouth College. Um, <clears throat> so I took introductory psychology like a lot of kids, and even then, there were large quantitative databases about human verbal learning and animal discrimination learning. And I noticed paradoxes in these learning data. You know, learning data are probes of self-organization, which is a big issue even today. For example, we studied data about how we learn lists of items or events. <laughs> it could be the alphabet, a poem, a dance, a series of navigational turns. And at least in the data, you learn the list by practicing it over and over with the items in the same order and present at the same rate so you can control it. And then you rest a little and then you do it again. And the task is given any item in the list, you try to predict the next one before it occurs. So the faster you present it, the harder it is. And you do that until you can predict all the correct items during a fixed number of runs through the list. You reach a criterion. And so it's an example of practice makes perfect. And then you look at the errors that were made cumulatively throughout this whole practice uh, event and there's a classical serial position curve for cumulative errors. And remarkably, there are more errors in the middle of the list than at the beginning or the end. That is, it's easier to learn the beginning and end of the list than it is the middle. And you know, we have a lot of examples of that in daily life, like you have an important relationship and it ends and you can more easily often remember how it began and ended and then the middle is a bit of a model. But you might have assumed that the list got harder and harder to learn 
the further you got into it because there was more and more response interference from all those previous items. But why then is the end easier to learn if the rest interval between successive presentations is longer than the presentation rate of the items themselves? So you try to practice at least once, you rest a while, you practice at least once, you rest a while. And if you do that, then the end of the list is easier than the middle. And if you increase the rest interval, then all the errors through the list collapse. That shows the non-occurrence of a future item. That is to say, resting more can influence the learning of all the past items. And that implied to me, which I thought was absolutely thrilling, that events can influence each other backwards in time. And we know in physics too, backwards in time events are really exciting. Backward learning is maybe a simpler example of this. Let's say you're just trying to learn A, B. Well, by practicing A, B, you also to some extent learn B, A. But let's say we're practicing A, B, C. Well, you can certainly learn that, which means that you tend to learn uh, associations in the future direction from B to C stronger than ones in the past direction from B to A. So that showed there was an asymmetry between future and past. Well, what the hell did that mean? So backward in time effects, uh, future past interactions. And by struggling with this for a long time, as a freshman, I derived modern neural networks, I derive what's called the additive model and the shunting model, including the current laws, variations of the current laws for short-term memory or cell activations and long-term memory for the adaptive ways that do learning and uh, remembering. And then a little after that, I derived the laws for medium-term memory or activity-dependent habituation. So short-term memory, medium-term memory, and long-term memory, all things I derived as a kid, and we still use variants of that today. If people want to see uh, summaries of this in an old paper, I have a, a 1968 article in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's on my webpage. Um, Anyway, when I was at Dartmouth, I, I managed to thrive in research because I was first in my class and people sort of gave me a little wiggle room. In particular, I got to know Al Hastorf, who was the chairman of the psychology department and he went on to become a much loved dean and provost at Stanford after I graduated. And John Kemeny was the chairman of mathematics, and he was famous for inventing the computer language basic, and he also was a pioneer in, uh, uh, you know, having lots of people interact on computers. He was actually Albert Einstein's last graduate assistant at Princeton, and they both gave me a lot of support and enable me to become the first joint major at Dartmouth in mathematics and psychology, which at the time was unheard of. And then I also got what was called a senior fellowship in my senior year. And so I spent the whole last year at Dartmouth doing research on neural networks. And that's how I got started. I got a good launch at Dartmouth, a big accident as a freshman, but then I was in an environment where I got you know, really a lot of wonderful support from colleagues who had the power uh, to protect me while I did my work, which wasn't always the case. You know, when you do what you're told, often people think, oh, that's fine if you get good grades, but as soon as you break out and start being too creative, or creative in a way that your mentors may not be able to follow, uh, in the minds of some, you become a problem but not at Dartmouth, not at Dartmouth.
since this beginning, what do you feel over your long career are your most significant accomplishments? Well, if I have to get a really big picture view of it, I'd say um, arguably the principal pioneer and to all these many years in between, still the current research leader of a revolutionary computational paradigm, which I like to call autonomous adaptive intelligence. I think autonomy is gonna be increasingly important in many applications. But a prime example of this autonomy are our own minds and brains. How each brain makes a mind is maybe the paradigmatic example of autonomous adaptive intelligence. And a key thing here to realize is, you know, you're not just diddling around doing a model here or there. In fact, there are universal design principles for biological intelligence that I believe also will necessarily follow in some form for artificial intelligence. And let me just give you one reason why. In 1980, 40 years ago, I published a paper in the main theory journal in psychology at the time, Psychological Review, which was about adaptive resonance theory. And <coughs> we'll come to what adaptive resonance theory is, I assume, in the next minutes. But one of the things my paper did was it carried out a thought experiment, a Gedanken experiment. If those of you who followed Einstein, who's one of my most beloved heroes of the past, you may realize that he did some of his most profound work uh, based on thought experiments, like his elevator thought experiment that helped him to derive the laws for general relativity theory. But my thought experiment in 1980 asked, <coughs> How can a system autonomously correct errors in a changing world if no one tells you uh, what the errors are? And by going through the thought experiment, <coughs> that led me to derive the laws of adaptive resonance theory as a unique kind of solution. So I therefore believe that how our brains make our minds will play a role, an increasing role in all types of autonomous adaptive intelligence in the science and technology of our century and beyond. And another thing that's I think worthy of note is, <coughs> excuse my cough, it's just asthma, a lifetime of asthma. I had to introduce not only new intuitive concepts, but also rigorous new mechanisms and mathematics to analyze them. After all, these were nonlinear dynamical systems with a lot of internal feedback. <coughs> like we always expect things that are happening to us, what's gonna happen next? Well, that internal feedback that those learned expectations are a form of internal nonlinear feedback. And um, so I had to introduce intuitive concepts and mechanisms and math about how our biological intelligence can self organize. Well, these are the most difficult kinds of revolutions to wrap your mind around. You know, first there are the new intuitions. What the hell is he talking about? And then the new math, well, what if, you know, you don't have the tools to think about it fluently. And one of the greatest such revolutions was the Newtonian revolution when Isaac Newton had to introduce the laws of, you know, gravity and then the math in order to express and analyze these laws. And even the Newtonian revolution in a much smaller uh, population, much less complex uh, scientific community. It took quite a while for it to penetrate. Now, more recent scientific revolutions, even relativity theory and quantum theory due to people like Einstein, Bohr and Heisenberg, you know, they had to have 
brilliant genius level intuitions to derive the appropriate concepts for these breakthroughs. But the math was there. All the math basically was 19th century math. They didn't have to introduce new math. Anyway, for the past 63 years, my colleagues and I, and as you mentioned, I've been blessed to have many gifted collaborators have been developing increasingly comprehensive neural architectures for how brains make minds. Uh, but at the beginning, as with many pioneers, there were very few, if any, people doing what I did when I got started and no institutions to support the work. I was lucky to have a couple of wonderful mentors. They didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I paid my dues by being first in my class. So they were willing to try to help me along. But uh, you can't run a field like that. <clears throat> and so to make it easier for students and young scientists to join the field, I therefore really devoted myself for a long time to help found several kinds of infrastructure with the help of a few key people. <clears throat> so I founded uh, the Department of Cognitive and Neural Systems at Boston University, which was a graduate and advanced undergraduate department. And we introduced a new curriculum of 18 interdisciplinary courses to help students learn everything that we could teach them, not only about our work, but everything that was known about how brains make minds and applications to neuromorphic technology. And CNS was a good prototype for a number of other departments that shortly thereafter were founded. And then I, I uh, founded the journal Neural Networks in 1988 uh, in order to have a place where people could publish research uh, that they may have done in our field and other journals soon follow that. And I founded INNS, the International Neural Network Society, to create a meeting place where people who are doing all sorts of interdisciplinary research in the field could come together at least once a year. And it, especially given how interdisciplinary the field was, you know, from the start, there were people in psychology, neurobiology, mathematics, computer science, engineering, even assorted philosophers who were interested. Um, and I was general chairman of uh, the 1987 IEEE, First International Conference on Neural Networks, <clears throat> Robert Heck Nielsen and Bart Costco had both been, I think it's fair to say, inspired by my research. So they went to IEEE and said it's time to have uh, an international conference on it. And they, for symbolism, if nothing else, wanted me to be the general chair, but it went more. It wasn't just symbolism because Gail Carpenter and I uh, organized uh, a very large number of <coughs> uh, special sessions with distinguished invited speakers from all walks of the field. And also um, uh, we <coughs> played a major role in reviewing all the papers. We designed with a company we found, the brochure. Uh, There's sort of a fun anecdote about how on Christmas Eve, we went to the Newton Highlands post office with thousands of these brochures in envelopes and asked them to help stamp them. And they said, no, you stamp them. And since at the time uh, you didn't have self-sticking stamps, Gail and I spent hours licking stamps to advertise the conference, which um, anyway, so <laughs> uh, small beginnings. And then when I was the first INNS president, I helped to organize the 1988 uh, first INNS annual meeting. And as you had mentioned, these two meetings, the 87 IEEE meeting and the 88 uh, INNS meeting then fused for various reasons. And in 1989, there was the first IJCNN conference, 
which has continued in one form or another to the present day. And having done that much infrastructure, I also organized multiple interdisciplinary centers at Boston University that had members from many of the Boston area uh, universities. One of the great things about the Boston area is there's so many uh, good schools and we had people working together across institutions. And, um, and then I was a busy boy training over a hundred PhD students, postdocs and faculty too. You know, I trained the faculty to be able to teach the curriculum that we put together for uh, cognitive and neural systems. So it was a lot of exciting infrastructure, a lot of birthing and it felt good. And, you know, I was able to do it because at Boston University, both the president, John Silver and the Dean and Provost, Dennis Berkey believed in it. And that was good luck. You know, they could have said, stop, we don't wanna support that. They let me, found a new department. Not every place lets you found a new department, think about it. So I was extremely lucky to be in a context where if we worked very hard and if we had enough good luck, there weren't brick walls all around. You know, there was, they didn't give us money or anything. All the money we had for our department and our center came from our own grants, but they were appreciative of it. They liked it. Steve, you seem very far from uh, beginning a serious retirement. Uh, ah. what, are you, what are you working on now? <laughs> well, I did officially <coughs> become emeritus on September 1st, 2019, due to an agreement that I reached with the current BU president and administration. <laughs> Basically, they just didn't want to pay me anymore. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I was <coughs> 79. It wasn't like uh, I was retiring at 65. So I had a, a really good run. So um, now um, the main difference is in the past, as I indicated, I collaborated with many people and often was leading <laughs> 10 or 20 research teams where I was a major source of the main new ideas and equations and parameter settings, but had very gifted collaborators who I tried to strengthen so I could do less and they could do more. But now I work by myself. I'm an old man. So I'm very happy that I was able to recently submit an article about how our brains learn, understand, and perform uh, music. Uh, I've always loved music like so many of us do and played the piano a little bit since I was a teenager. And you might say, well, why now? Well, it took decades to build the infrastructure of concepts and models that I needed to say anything about music, and I view this paper as just a drop in the bucket. For example, um, you need to understand just to get off the ground how lists of items, whether they're uh, lists, well, just let's get to music, whether they're lyrics or melodies, those are lists of items. How can they temporarily be stored in a working memory? And then how can they be learned or unitized so that you can read them out for fluent performance. And you gotta be able to do it with lists where you're repeating notes and you're repeating letters or words. So these are called item order rank working memories. Took me a long time to discover and develop them because you can't just write out any laws whatsoever for a working memory. They have to be able to support learning. So it's the interaction of information processing and autonomous learning in a stable way that is the key. So I submitted that. I haven't got a review yet. 
uh, I've been invited to give a steady stream of keynote lectures on Zoom instead of traveling to Italy, uh, Scotland, it would have been IJCNN and Thailand, uh, but I've enjoyed recording them on Zoom. My magnum opus, which I've been writing basically all my life, uh, a book that gives a, a self-contained, non-technical uh, introduction to a wide range of topics about mind and brain with where my, my theories and the ones I've developed with my colleagues help to integrate all this. Uh, it's coming out this spring, Oxford University Press is publishing it. It's called Conscious Mind, Resonant Brain, How Each Brain Makes a Mind. It's this link between brain mechanisms and mental functions that's key to what I've done and which I, you know, there's still not enough people who know how to do that very well. Uh, also in 2020, I published an article on explainable and reliable AI. And in fact, my uh, talk I gave, Ryan and S was on that topic. I've published an article providing a unified analysis and synthesis of cortical maps and multiple modalities, a great deal of information processing in our minds uh, is done within a, a map structure. I mean, simple maps would be, for example, tonotopic maps, you know, frequencies uh, of sound are organized in an ordered map. Colors are organized in maps. Uh, but a lot of things you might not even think of as being in a map are in maps. Uh, so a huge amount of stuff comes together and, um, and things that seem totally different can have the same underlying organizational design. Um, and for example, I show that maps of orientations and maps of place value numbers share such a design, you know, things you don't think of uh, when you're thinking about them in their particularity, but in their unity, they're very much the same mechanistically. And that gives you a huge, uh, 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 how do you say, amplification of understanding, not only how it works, but how it got to be that way, because the brain can be promiscuous, but it doesn't have to invent too many different designs to go a long way. Uh, I just finished yesterday uh, a major article about attention and all of its variety. There are several uh, functionally different kinds of attention and there are different uh, uh, kinds of functions for attention in different brain regions. There's an intimate link between attention and consciousness. And that'll be appearing, uh, I guess, you know, if they accept it and everything, but it was invited. So I assume they'll accept it in a handbook on cognitive and systems neuroscience. Um, uh, I finished uh, and it's, uh, I just did a, you know, I was asked to do some minor revisions uh, a historical and conceptual synthesis of results about autonomous adaptive intelligence for a 50th anniversary IEEE transactions on systems man and cybernetics special issue. Uh, last year in 2019, I did something that I, I love to do as much as I loved writing about music. I, I wrote an article about how we see art and how painters make it. And I, I was invited to give lectures in Spain and other places about it. And that, those lectures and that article are on my webpage. Um, and I'm hoping to continue to write a series of integrative articles like some of the things I've mentioned uh, with some new insights also included if I'm lucky. And I have a list of topics to write on that. <laughs> it's very long at this stage of my life because no matter how hard you think and how hard you work, it's just a drop in the bucket. 
<laughs> health willing. So that's about it for the moment. Well, that's extremely impressive. I'd like to go back a little bit. You've already talked a little bit about the beginning of INNS. Uh, could you amplify that? How was the International Neural Network Society begun? Well, <coughs> one of the realities of working through the 60s to the 80s was, it was incredibly hard to publish models uh, that did an interdisciplinary synthesis of different kinds of data. Um, for example, one of my first loves in studying mind is how we, how our brains see, and there are huge databases <coughs> about vision, both psychological and neurobiological, going back to Helmholtz, Maxwell, and Mach. And so I would submit papers to the main journal at that time, publishing the kinds of data that I was explaining about vision. <coughs> and that journal was vision research. And they sent it back to me without review, saying, we don't publish stuff like that. And I would then, I was always very shy, but you know, sometimes it's either do or die. Either you let people crush you or you fight back. I wrote, well, why do you bother publishing data if you don't want anyone to explain it? So as of today, I've published at least as many papers in vision research as I think just about anyone in the world. And the same thing was true in Psychological Review. I mentioned my 1980 paper in Psych Review, but I tried to publish a paper there in 1978, and the editor-in-chief at the time, Bill Estes, was a leading mathematical psychologist. He was a great pioneer. He was trained as an experimentalist, though, doing learning theory. He worked with Skinner, who you may know is famous for work on instrumental conditioning. Um, his famous 1941 paper, Estes and Skinner, but he realized that data by themselves aren't enough and it's really important to try to build models of it. But since Bill was trained only as an experimentalist and never had the good fortune to study math, his struggles, the most he could do was to use finite Markov chains to do basically statistical urn models of learning where you'd have two urns in one urn, you'd have a certain number of elements that were learned and another you'd earn, you'd have elements that weren't learned. And if elements went from the unlearned to the learned urn, that was learning. And if they went from the learned urn to the unlearned urn, that was forgetting. And then, you know, you might have more urns with different, but it was really the most you could do with it <coughs> was to try to fit probabilities of group learning data. And here I came along with nonlinear neural networks trying to explain parametric data about individual learning. And he sent it back to, he said, we don't publish stuff like that. And I, I reminded him, he's supposed to be a leader of the mathematical psychology movement and I knew him. And that if he's not gonna publish stuff like that, he's never gonna publish anything new and his journal will become irrelevant. So now I have probably more papers in Psych Review than anyone else alive. Although I haven't been counting, but you know, we published them fluently. And in some cases, it just didn't work out. And you know, my 1978 paper didn't get into psychological review. I had to fight that. But by 1980, the flow began. So there was a continual struggle just to get journals, but I realized we can't do this forever. I might, just by virtue of the fact that I've been in these experimental fields too. I had a foot on each camp. Um, 
I might be able to push this, but you can't expect people to come into the field, young people, and not have a journal. And so that's why I founded the Journal Neural Networks. And I got to know the editor-in-chief at Pergamon Press, and he was a big believer in the field. And, that, and they were publishers of vision research at that time. So, you know, they, they were sort of part of this picture. <laughs> um, anyway, so then, you know, if you have a journal, you have to have uh, places to train people to do the research to publish in the journal. And so that's one of the reasons I founded the Department of Cognitive and Neural Systems and various research institutes at BU, I, um, you know, multidisciplinary university research initiative things from DARPA, ONR, and Air Force. I got big grants to do that. Uh, from NSF, I got one of their science uh, uh, of learning center grants, a Kenya grant for 50 million. You know, I was able to, with my colleagues, uh, get people key program managers in Washington to believe in us. Uh, one of the most lovely things was um, uh, Gail Carpenter and I, who've been married very happily and productively for many years, <clears throat> one uh, summer were going to drive to Cape Cod where we like to spend time during the summer, but there was a, an annual meeting of the Society for Mathematical Psychology at Brown University in Providence. And, and so um, we said, oh, you know, I would go and give a talk at the meeting and we just swing through Providence and then go down to the Cape. It's hardly out of the way. And, and I had colleagues in the, in the society who I liked, et cetera. Anyway, <clears throat> One of the people in the audience where I spoke came up to me later and said, I assume you have very big grants. And I said, no, not at all. You know, I was just an MIT professor and we all shared in a group grant that the whole department got at that time. And you got some salary out of it basically. And, you know, students, you know, had their research assistantships. And if you could attract a student, you could do some research. And I said, no. So he then did an amazing thing. He um, uh, invited program managers from all the agencies in Washington, NSF, ONR, ARO, AFOSR, DARPA, NIH to come to his office at NSF. And I lectured to all those program managers for a whole day. So they would find out about this revolutionary young guy. And that opened many doors, the money became accessible. So a number of events like that happened where I view it as good luck combined with hard work and a gift from God, I guess, that uh, made it possible to, you know, do a lot of foundational work. Um, you know, I could say more about our department, our centers, you know, um, INNS was founded to have a place where the people who were trained to work in the field could get together each year. And my goal in founding INNS was to make it an interdisciplinary uh, hub. And uh, so the annual meeting of INNS, the first annual meeting in 88, I uh, worked with Gail Carpenter particularly. I, Harold Sue was also very helpful, but I did most of the outreach at that time of this kind. I got 14 other societies to want to cooperate with the first annual meeting, including the IEEE Computer Society. But there were psychologies, the, the Mathematical Psychology Society, just, you know, just go down the list of interdisciplinary societies related to this core, 14 different societies. And that was the dream. 
for it to be an interdisciplinary hub, not to replace or compete with more disciplinary established societies. And it had a brilliant first meeting. But anyway, for one reason or another, it then rapidly fused in a couple, in a year or so with uh, uh, the IEEE uh, conference, which after all, I was the general chairman of, so I have nothing against it, but it did narrow the focus of INNN to be more toward um, applications for quite some time. And I view applications as crucially important, if nothing else, you know, if you're in a field, you're talking about intelligence and you have rigorous models. Well, if you can't show that those models could solve hard problems in the real world, uh, that's a problem. That's a, so the goal was always to try to solve the hardest problems on models at the, at the level of maturity that they were, could solve. And of course they were incrementally developing. And in the old days, the computers were so much slower, uh, you know, what you could do without a VLSI chip was quite limited. And, and at several times we were able to start collaborating with uh, masters in VLSI, including Carver Mead and Federico Fijin, but there wasn't sustained funding for it. And, you know, they were trying to build synaptics and focus on near-term applications. So there needed to be some extraneous funding to help broaden the scope. Anyway, there you have it. So is that enough or you want to get me going more on that topic or the next topic? I'd like to we move on to say... The society, INNS, was, was established a little over 30 years ago now. What about for the future? What should INNS be doing uh, looking ahead into the future? Well, as I briefly indicated, um, <clears throat> INNS uh, got linked with IEEE through IJCNN. Uh, and the IEEE Computational Science Society, which came later, um, I think to too great a degree, uh, INNS has to a shocking degree lost autonomy as a, a society. And there were lots of problems due to that. Um, in the past, I hardly think about these things and I don't like thinking about difficult things like that now, especially, but, but that merger or that cooperation was not always healthy for INNS. It really kept it from becoming what it could have been, which is an, a true interdisciplinary hub where people who are developing models that are primarily psychological or neurobiological or interested in the mathematics of the models or uh, just computational issues or applications, all different aspects of it could come together and speak in a, you know, a forum where they can all learn from each other. Now, I don't know what is possible given all this long time with all these problems in the past, but I do know what would be ideal. It would be ideal if INS could become as much as possible a truly interdisciplinary hub again, uh, much more autonomous so that, um, you know, whereas IJCNN is, a good thing and should continue. And I, I think INNS does try to do additional meetings as well. I think doing more of that, you know, with more psychological, neurobiological and what have you groups would be good. Now, one of the difficulties, it's everything depends on timing. And because INNS didn't maintain 
its flourishing identity in an interdisciplinary uh, framework, you know, people rushed in to fill the gap. So, you know, there uh, there's computational neuroscience now, there's uh, MIPS now, there are all these competitors in a way that's very healthy, but in a way it also uh, happened the way it did because INNS was weakened uh, by its fusion with IEEE. Uh, so I think it would be re really, one of the things I love about the INNS is it's, it remains a truly democratic institution. It has elections and it has a membership that has the greatest privilege of any institution, including the United States electorate, you know, to elect a president and a vice president and what have you. And NIPS doesn't do that. NIPS has been a clique meeting uh, from the get-go. It's run by Terry Zanashki. Uh, Terry wanted it that way. That's what he wanted, I believe, to have an INNS, but I, I wouldn't allow it. So, um, uh, IEEE also has some democracy. I don't, I don't understand its politics, but I do know that there are elections and what have you. So I love that INNS is democratic and, and therefore has to follow the lead of the people who are drawn to join it. But I, I, do, I do think that at this time in our history, especially with billion dollar investments, uh, in intelligence, that INNS, if it got some of that money for the development of its uh, membership and its various interdisciplinary training programs and for special um, sessions at its own meeting and specialty meetings, uh, that could be very, very valuable. I mean, for example, uh, well, yeah, you know, uh, I'm blocking on some of the names of it, but but I know in Europe, my, my friend and colleague, Henry Markram, uh, got a, a big European grant and um, to build a center uh, for Europe in Paris. And, you know, it wouldn't hurt if INNS had more embodied infrastructure um, with, you know, if it, if it became a, a, a thriving enough establishment with a modest office in Washington, DC, where the action is, or, or Arlington, Virginia, um, <coughs> stuff like that. But it all depends who's leading and how much energy they have and who they know to get some of these resources and can they convince people who have money, even if they're not government agencies, you know, there are the Bill Gates of the world. I know that they are rightly donating billions to Africa where there are huge health and other crises <clears throat> but it would take a pittance to transform uh, what INNS could become from someone who's really rich. So I don't know, do you guys know anyone really rich? <laughs> if I were really rich, I'd give you a few million, but can't do it, sorry. <clears throat> I think it would be very interesting to give you free reign to, to talk about the fields as far as what people are doing right and what people you think and how you think people are going off the tra off the rails. You mean in AI or in in general? Well, in general, maybe a little too general. Why don't I start with <coughs> AI, which is already too much for me? It, because I don't follow everything going on in AI. One thing I do feel is it was a really good step for AI to include 
neural network modeling and its definition, since our brains, after all, are the best examples we have of intelligence. And that wasn't always the case. In fact, early on, people like Marvin Minsky <coughs> was one of the founders of AI, um, had tried to do neural networks when he was young and he couldn't. And Marvin considered himself one of the smartest men around. And if he couldn't do it, then he figured, why should anyone else waste their time doing it? So he made working on neural networks a definite no-no <coughs> wherever he had influence and instead he turned to the von Neumann computer architecture as a metaphor for intelligence. And that started um, <coughs> a lot of AI research at MIT and Tech, and Tech Square and so on. Years later, Marvin realized that you really need to go back to neural nets because that's where you get your best examples of the intelligence they're trying to emulate and when I heard about this I <coughs> wanted to get him invited to give a lecture at um, the largest annual <coughs> sorry neural network conference because I figured you know he's one of the great pioneers for better or worse if he's getting interested what if, let's hear, hear what people have to say and um, so Marvin, unfortunately, never prepared lectures, ever, ever, ever. And so he got on the stage and he was clearly unprepared. It was a little embarrassing. So what he did was he told random jokes. <laughs> and then he, he stopped for a moment he, and he said, you know, I want to tell you the biggest mistake I made uh, and everyone's listening attentively, and he says, and it was to underestimate Grossberg. And everyone just reported, <laughs> they thought that was hilarious because he was in a hall that I built. People there were directly or indirectly there because of the blood, sweat, and tears of years of work that I initiated. And then I got a lot of help with by a lot of dedicated people. So, uh, and everyone there knew it. So it was a kind of bittersweet moment. Uh, I wish he hadn't tried to suppress my work when I was a young investigator at MIT. Um, so, um, but you know, if you wanna ask what's right or wrong with AI today, I, I do think there's too much just basically blind application of an algorithm like deep learning without cons a sufficient conceptual and mathematical analysis of its strengths and weaknesses. Every, every model has a proper domain of application. For example, already in 1988, that's 32 years ago, I wrote an article in the first issue of Neural Networks where I <coughs> contrasted the learning engine that deep learning uses, which is the backpropagation algorithm with properties of the adaptive resonance theory that I had introduced in 76 and others had worked very hard with me and others I didn't work with to develop. And I listed 17 problems, serious problems of backpropagation and therefore of deep learning that had already been solved by adaptive resonance. Uh, in fact, deep learning, you know, many people say is just backprop on steroids. And these are not problems you can ignore. In fact, I have a paper this year on deep, on um, uh, rely, um, explainable and reliable AI. It's on my webpage and uh, it's published in Frontiers in Neurobotics. I it was invited by Jeff Kritschmar to to contribute to a special issue about explainable AI. So in particular, deep learning is untrustworthy. 
uh, because it's unexplainable. You look at a prediction made by deep learning, you have no idea why it made it. And it's unreliable because it could at any moment in time experience catastrophic forgetting and forget a good part and an unpredictable part of what it already learned. So it's untrustworthy and unreliable. So you simply can't justify using it in any life or death application because you don't know why it works and you don't know if it won't, if it just crash on you. <clears throat> so you can't really, if you know what you're doing, use it for a medical or financial uh, application because you can't drive a car. What is that? Or perhaps driving a car. Yeah, or, yes, and that's life or death too, very much so. You know, you might want to have it as an assistant, but boy, you better have plenty of time to override it. And you, and, you know, it's hard to imagine um, training people to understand well enough what uh, the basis on which it's making predictions when the algorithm can't be explained to know when you can, you know, get your eyes off the road. I would never use it for anything that I depended on. Um, so <clears throat> lots of people in neural networks use adaptive resonance theory, but um, in AI, many fewer people even know it's there. And instead of the minimum amount of scholarship you'd need to realize there was an alternative, that overcame these 17 problems. So maybe you should try to develop that as many people have tried, uh, most notably in uh, INNS, Don Wunsch and his colleagues. Instead, they try to overcome these foundational problems of deep learning by what I consider epicycles. And I talk about that in my lecture and my paper where they try to just add stuff to deep learning to cover its problems, but everything they're adding has non-local uh, computations, which themselves are unexplainable. So I call it epicycle because I think of it as trying to patch up the Ptolemaic um, uh, system for the uh, solar system, rather than just saying the darn thing is wrong you got to use the Copernican system and then you don't need epicycles. Well, R is a Copernican system for autonomous adaptive intelligence and to the extent of which the thought experiment is true, it is paradigmatic. And a lot of people should be working to make it better to build on it because its foundations are secure. But I think that this inward trend in AI may be due to the fact that a lot of the young people aren't getting trained broadly. They, you know, hyper-specialization and training. I also very much respect intense pressures for short-term results, especially in industry where people need an application yesterday. And uh, the simpler the algorithm they can apply, the more relief the practitioner will feel because at least he or she could present something today. But deep learning can support the revolutionary paradigm of autonomous adaptive intelligence. And I feel that is the future of intelligent computing and, and using deep learning. You're gonna hit one after another, after another brick wall, no matter how many epicycles you add and life is short. Let me tell you as someone who's turning 81 this month, Life is short and I'm lucky and lucky to still be alive because a lot of my friends never got to 81. Uh, and you might as well put your cards into something that will live on way after you, that has a future. That's what I would do. That's what I've always done. I've never been afraid to walk away from something where I thought there was a foundational mistake, never. I might not be smart enough to see them all, but I would never commit my life to something that I know has to hit a brick wall. Anyway, I don't know if that's said enough about- I think it's very helpful. And uh, we're certainly very lucky to have you here with us uh, at uh, 81.
uh, moving to close things out, you did talk about uh, students having lack of breadth in their, in their foundation. What advice would you give for a researcher just starting out in the field? Well, <coughs> again, if I had to give a big picture start to an answer, I'd say it's really important for a young researcher to find problems about which they're passionate, problems that they passionately want to solve, questions whose answers they desperately want to know. And I, I, I say that because problems and questions could be very different for different people. And if you don't have the drive, the need to know to overcome obstacles, uh, why bother? Why not just go out and get a job with you know a lot of money and have a happy family life supported by a nice big salary? I mean, there needs to be passion to want to do science if you're going to sustain it or you know teaching if you want to be a teacher uh that's a noble profession but hopefully you'll be passionate about your teaching and i think if you have that passion the need to know it'll be harder for you to be blinded by you know political self-interest of other people to try to keep you doing what they tell you to do, because that's, that's, not way to, that's not a way to live an authentic life of passionate engagement. You will, you will use Google intelligently and scour the literature for what's there to help you fulfill your passion. You know, there's a certain passivity in, you know, just doing what you're told and Never mind that deep learning is unreliable and untrustworthy. You know, you're, you know, you do have to get your degree. So a few years, maybe you'll do it and maybe you'll get a few good results. But one of the things I've seen over and over in my long life as a scientist for over 60 years is fads come and go. You know, people might lurch into the next fad and and they, they think they're gonna get a free lunch. You know, there's a path of least resistance. And then a few years later, it's just all washed down the drain and they really got nothing. They might've gotten something, they got their salary, they might've gotten a promotion. That's something, they might've gotten tenure. That's something. <coughs> but at some point you want to use those gains to launch yourself into a life of continued interest and relevance. And, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm 81, almost this month, and I've been doing this since I was 17. And as I've indicated, I'm still mentally alive. Now, of course, I've had so much luck. I have a wonderful family and I've had good luck with friends and, on and on and on, but um, but I haven't hit a brick wall. And I just submitted a paper about music <laughs> after all. And last year, a, a paper about art. So, you know, I mean, what's that worth? I mean, so be true to yourself, but find your passion if you don't have one then try to do no harm and try to do as much good as you can. Be generous, uh, offer your skills to others. Maybe they'll have greater strength in fulfilling them, whatever. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sharing these, these ideas with us. And thank you for your lifetime of service to the field. <laughs>